Welcome to Faith Point, the podcast ministry of First Southern Baptist Church of Prescott Valley with Senior Pastor Carol Eldreth. Our goal is to allow our faith to intersect with real life. So let's join Pastor Carol today as he shares with us from God's Word. And now I want you to take out your Bibles, if you would, and find the book of, see, we're, oh yeah, we're in Romans, aren't we? Okay, the book of Romans. We are still in Romans chapter 8 today. Uh, we're right kind of in the middle of the book of Romans as we're walking through, looking at this testament of faith in action. And as you find your sermon notes in, in that place in Romans chapter 8, just Romans 8 today, that'll be fine. Um, let's bow in prayer as we come to God's word. Father, we just want to tell you how much we love you today, how much we appreciate your word, and we appreciate your church. Father, we thank you that we're able to be a part of the family of God that we do life together, and that it makes an impact on our lives because of that. Father, we pray that as we come to your word today, that you'd give us encouragement where we need it. Father, we pray also that you would let your spirit give us conviction where that's needed as well. And Father, help us to respond appropriately. Father, there are those who are here today who simply do not know Jesus as Savior and Lord. And today is that day, maybe when they need to trust Jesus to come into their heart and be their savior but there are many of us who know Jesus as our savior but still struggle on a daily basis so father give us encouragement uh, to know how to live that life of faith the way that you've called us to and that life of community the way that you've called us to for we pray these things in Jesus name amen today we're talking about surviving Saturday after those beautiful songs that Kristen just read I want to show you a picture Sorry about that, Kristen. That's just the way it kind of goes today. How many of you know what, what movie that is? Groundhog Day. That's right. How many of you know how old that movie is? It's about 26 years old. It, was, it was, first came out in 1993. And I've got to tell you, it's one of my favorite movies. In fact, this last February 2nd, which is Groundhog Day, um, TBS showed it all day long, and it was a good thing it was a Saturday. I wouldn't have gotten any work done at all uh, that I should have gotten done because I just kept watching it all day long over and over and over again. It just seemed an appropriate thing to do. And, um, and, and I don't, I don't want to give away the ending, even though it's 26 years old. Though you can probably figure out, if you've never seen it, how it resolves itself. Um, we've just put a little thought into it because it's a Hollywood movie and they've never really come up with anything new or original in, in decades anyway. And so you kind of figure that out. Um, but, but the part of the movie I want to use in today's sermon has to do with the premise of the movie. Just what it was all about. Uh, Bill Murray is the actor, and he's the, he's the main character. And he, he plays this obnoxious weatherman who's forced to live the same day, February 2nd, Groundhog Day, again and again and again and again and again, and it just goes on and on. Every day, the same things happen when he wakes up. And sometimes he deals with them well, and sometimes he deals with them really, really poorly. But no matter what, he can't move past February the 2nd. Every day is the same. Now, I don't know how many of you feel that way, but I would imagine that could be pretty much all of us at some time or another, where we feel like, I get up in the morning, and every day is the same. And I don't know how to get past that. Uh, every day, it's the same old set of problems. It's the same set of struggles. And try as, we, as, as hard as we can, we can never make any real progress, it seems. Does that sound like anybody's life in here? Man, I, it just does, doesn't it? Uh, you take one step forward one day, and the next day you take two steps back, and you make a little progress, and the next day you lose it all. That's kind of the story of a lot of lives for Christians. Not that it was, should be, but it is. I know people who live this way, and I have to confess that I've spent more time ne than necessary in my own life uh, doing that. And, and that's not a great testimony, but that's who we are as Christians if we are not paying attention to what God has done for this, for us, rather. And I want you to know if that's how you feel, that you're not alone, because a whole lot of us in this room would be honest and say, yeah, that's pretty much the same boat 
that I've lived most of my life in. You know what we are? We're stuck in a never-ending Saturday. We're just stuck there on that never-ending Saturday, like February 2nd was this, this year, this past February 2nd. And what do I mean by that? I mean that on Good Friday, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We know that story, don't we? 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was led up Calvary's mountain, and he was nailed to a cross. And, and as he hung there dying, one of the last words that he spoke was one word. It was to telestai. And I talked about this not too long ago. And we said that that word to telestai means what? It is finished. And so he cried out, it is finished. But another way that that, that can be translated also means paid in full that what Jesus came to do was paid in full. That referred to his work of salvation on our behalf, and it refers to our sins, that they had been forgiven, completely paid in full, not because of anything that we did, not because of anything that we could ever do, but because Jesus Christ hung on the cross, paid that, that price for our sins with his blood, and he died there on that cross, finishing that work of our salvation paying in full the debt that we owed. And that means that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, whether it was 26 years ago or whether it was six years ago or whether you do that today, when you trust Jesus Christ to be your Savior, He washes away your sins. Now that's a remarkable thing. He removes the guilt of your past. It doesn't matter what was in your past. All that sin, all that garbage that was there, he simply washes it away. He removes that guilt. And the Bible says that he puts our sins behind his back. A picture of him not seeing it anymore. And he moves it as far away as the east is from the west. And the Bible says he buries it in a sea of his forgetfulness. You and I still remember it, but God doesn't. When Jesus said, it is finished, and I've paid the debt, it is paid in full, Jesus made it possible for God to wash our sin away and remember it no longer. That's the reality of who we are in Jesus Christ. And when you accept Jesus as your, your Lord and Savior, you can know that you are forgiven and that you've been given eternal life and that you will live with him forever. That's the assurance every Christian can have because of what happened on Good Friday when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That was Friday. And we know what happened on Sunday then, don't we? Because Sunday, following Good Friday, was the very first Easter Sunday, wasn't it? Because on that morning, that lifeless body of Jesus that had been wrapped in a shroud and placed in a grave lay there, and then the Spirit of God entered that tomb, and he breathed back into Jesus the breath of life, and Jesus' heart began to beat again, his lungs began to fill with air, his eyes were opened, and he got up, and he walked out of that tomb alive forevermore again. That was on Sunday. Jesus was raised from the dead. And you know what the Bible tells us? It tells us that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead on that very first Easter Sunday morning is available to you and me now as a Christian. Look at what Paul says in our chapter here in Romans chapter 8 in verse 11. He says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you a life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Now I think it's interesting that Paul wrote those very words in the middle of the book of Romans and in the middle of this chapter of Romans that deals with the victory, the spiritual victory that we can have as believers in Jesus Christ. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to each one of us, who, and he gives us the power to live a victorious Christian life, and that's the promise of Easter. So we have the reality that Jesus went to the cross, died for our sins, paid the price in full, and God washed our sin away 
putting it in the sea of his forgetfulness. And two days later, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, promising us, promising us that power of victory in our lives. But here's the problem. Many Christians, and I probably could say most Christians, are caught somewhere between Friday night and Sunday morning in this ever, never-ending Saturday. We know that our sins are forgiven, but we haven't gotten to the power yet. And we don't know what to do about it. And it's frustrating, but we live there anyway. And we're just stuck in Saturday. And we've been saved, and we're forgiven, and we know it, but the power of the resurrection just always seems to be just a little bit beyond our reach. I want that power, Jesus. I want that power so that I don't live in this Saturday of frustration, of always falling back and, and dealing with sin and never having victory over it, but it just seems like it's out of our reach just a little bit. Does that sound like life as many of you know it? If you're living there right now, I want you to know that that's not where God wants you to be. That's not what he created you for. He has more for you, so much, much more, and he wants you to move beyond Saturday and learn to live in resurrection power. So the question is, how do we do that? How do you do that? How do you put those promises of Easter to work in your life? And so this morning I want to talk to you about three things that will help you move from a never-ending Saturday to a permanent Easter Sunday. And the first thing that Paul tells you to do is to believe it's possible. You have to begin by believing it is a possibility. Believe that it's possible to move past Saturday into Easter Sunday resurrection power in your life. Many people don't expect victory in their Christian life. I think if we were all honest, we'd always, we, most of us would say, yeah, there's times when I just, I just assumed I would never have victory over sin. Even though I've been saved for, for, for a short time or I've been saved for decades, I just expect that I'm going to keep losing this battle after battle as long as I live. We just buy in to that lie of Satan that we are doomed to always sin and never have victory over it. You think that at unanswered prayer and discouragement and, and frustration and stress and lack of power are the best that you can ever hope for. And what a terrible way to choose to live. But that's where most Christians are at. That's where we find ourselves way too often on that Saturday. The Bible tells us that we can set our, high, our sights a lot higher than that, friends. Um, the Bible says that we are, as we saw last week in verse 37 here in Romans chapter 8, what? More than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors. The Bible says in, in Romans 6, 14, a couple of chapters earlier, remember, sin shall not be your master. God that did not save you, did not send Jesus Christ to die on the cross, pay the price for your sins, and then raise him from the dead in order that you would still be a slave to sin and that you would live a defeated Christian life. He did just the opposite. He said, I did all of that so that you can be more than a conqueror and not a slave to sin. That's God's plan for every one of us. His plan is victory. That's your birthright as a Christian. And you can claim that. You don't have to live in doubt and defeat. You can walk in the power of God and you can experience his victory every day. So you need to stop saying words like, well, you know what, I'll never be able to. Or you need to stop saying, well, I had this problem all my life and I guess I always will until the day I die. And you need to stop saying things like, I'm just a person with a bad temper and I'm just a person given to lust or I'm just selfish by nature or I'm just. Those are defeatist words, but those are not God's words to you. Those are Satan's words to you, Christian. You are more than a conqueror. 
Sin is not supposed to be your master, and you don't have to give in to that. So you stop saying those things because that's not the person God created you to be. Do you realize God created you according to the Bible, here in Romans 8, 29, to be conformed to the likeness of his Son? Those are the very words Paul used. He said, God formed you to be in the likeness of Jesus Christ. One who defeated sin is death, not one who was defeated by sin and death. That's who you're called to be. That's who you're created to be. Paul goes on to say in verse 31 here of chapter 8, If God is for us, who can be against us? There's nothing stopping you. There's no one who stops you as from being the one who God called you to be. You can always be in God's love, according to what... Uh, uh, we heard earlier at the beginning of our worship service that God called you to be that person. With God on your side, anything is possible. The idea of becoming this victorious Christian may seem impossible to you right now. The idea of becoming a victorious Christian may seem impossible to anybody who knows you right now. However, there is one who believes it's possible, and that's the one who died on the cross for your sins. And Jesus not only believes you are worth the price he paid for you, he believes that he can make you worthy of the price that he paid for you. By his power, you can be holy, because that's who he calls you to be. And the longer we live in this endless Saturday, the less we believe that we will ever arrive at Sunday. There's an interesting thing about the movie Groundhog Day. 26 years ago, it came out. Probably for the better part of 26 years, there's been this ongoing argument about how long Bill Murray, the weatherman, stayed there in, in, in Poxahoney in this never-ending Groundhog Day. How many days did he wake up and do the same thing over and over and over again because as the movie progresses he learns skills and those kinds of things and so the 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 producer of the movie said well he really was there 10 years living the same day over and over for 10 years but there's another group it, this is this is it's a stupid movie and people are arguing about how long it's been and um and, and there's another group that said, well, if he did all these skills, it would have taken him eight years, eight months, and, nine, and 16 days. But then there's another group. And the other group says, well, you know, really, to learn the skills and do the thing, all the things that he did in all those endless days of February 2nd that came along, it would have taken him 33 years, 350 days. That's basically... You do the math, that's real close to 34 years. 34, three and a half decades almost of being stuck on Groundhog's Day, on February the 2nd. And we think, well, that's kind of silly. But I got to tell you, I have known over the years, over the decades, I've known people in their 20s young adults who are excited about Jesus Christ. Excited to live for Him in power and victory. But life happens. And it's somewhere in their 30s and in their 40s and in their 50s, the excitement is gone. It just drains out of them. And most of us would say, oh yeah, that was me. And they get to their 50s and 60s. 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Decades of living in a never-ending Saturday. And not knowing how to get out of that time warp. Decades of defeat. Decades of struggling. Decades of stop believing just accepting that this is my lot in life, that somehow I'm a broken Christian and I'm a bad person and God does not love me anymore. And by the scores and scores and scores 
they drop out of the Christian community. So it didn't work. It just wasn't any good. And we don't know what to do about it. And even though they know in their hearts they're saved and forgiven by the blood of Jesus, they've given up hope that they'll ever be able to walk in resurrection power. And I want to tell you today, as strongly as I know how, don't give up hope. Instead of giving up hope, let me tell you, change your expectations. Change your expectations. You can do that. You can decide, I am going to expect something different. You can believe that it is possible to live a victorious life. And once you believe it's possible, then you're going to begin to discover ways to make it happen. So Paul says, first of all, if you want to stop living in a never-ending Saturday and move to a permanent Easter Sunday, believe it's possible. And then secondly, as you begin to believe it's possible, start feeding your new nature. Start feeding your new nature. There's a story about a tribal chief who told his young grandson a parable about the human condition. And you probably heard it, but we're going to talk about it here for just a moment anyway. He said to his young grandson, Son, there are two wolves that live inside of every one of us. He said, One is good and one is bad. One fights for anger and greed and jealousy and rage, but the other one fights for kindness and joy and love and happiness. And he said, These two wolves fight it out every day in our lives. And, and every one of us goes through that. And he said, son, it is up to you to determine which wolf wins. The grandson thought about that for a minute. And he said, well, how do I determine which of those wolves is going to win that battle in my life? The good one or the bad one? How do I determine that? And the old chief looked at his grandson and he said, son... The wolf you feed is the wolf who wins the battle. And that's true in every one of our lives. There's a wolf in every one of us. Our old nature. That's bad. But as Christians, we have a new nature. And we have to determine who's going to win. Will it be our new nature or our old nature? So how... Do you feed that new nature? If you want your new nature to win, if you want that, that life that says, this is, this is a godly life, it is a holy life, it is a life in which I know happiness and joy and peace and the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, how do I go about feeding that new nature? Let me give you just some simple things that you can do. Because you're already doing them right now. Because one you can do is you just simply show up at church. Just be in church. Come to church. And that's where you're at right now, in case you haven't figured that out. We're doing church right now, this morning. And so you do that. You listen to sermons. And you say, yeah, I'm doing that now, and I'm thinking this is not so good. But you need to do that anyway. You just listen to, you begin to listen to God's word as people preach it. So you come to church and you hear a sermon. You can, you can, boy, in the world we live in today, you are, there is no lack of sermons you can listen to. You can go back on our website and you can listen to, to a whole bunch of past sermons uh, that you can go back and listen to. You can go to other websites and listen to sermons. You can turn on your radio. You can turn on your television and listen to sermons. But don't let that keep you from coming to church. Don't make that your church because that's not. You need to be in community. Remember, today is about together. Life is better together, not life is better with a television set or radio in front of you. But you can listen there once in a while, but you need to be in church together too. And then you need to read your Bible. Read your Bible. Spend time in God's Word. So I don't know where to read. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of ways that you can do it. But um, you can pick up the, an app for your, your smartphone or your computer. I would encourage you to go to Uversion, Y-O-U-V-E-R-S-I-O-N, Uversion. 
Um, just, and you can, you can download that for free on your, tele, on your telephone, on your, your, your pad, on your computer. And literally, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reading plans there. And you can, you can choose from probably 30 or 40 different translations of the Bible. So if you like NIV, you can go there. If you like ESV, you can go there. If you like King James, New King James. If you like New Living Translation. And then just all kinds of them that are there. You can, you can find it in all kinds of different languages. Hundreds of languages. No, well, I don't know if it's hundreds, but it's a lot of languages that it's in right now. So you can read it in your heart language. For those of you who English is not your heart language. And then you can go to these reading plans and you can find, I don't know how many different reading plans. I'm, done, I'm doing a different one than I did last year through your version, but reading through the Bible every day so that I will finish the Bible in one year uh, on that reading plan. And you can do that and you can, you can start it anytime you want to. You can start on the 1st of January. You can start it today if you want. And then a year from, uh, a year from today, you'll be done. And you will have read the whole Bible. Uh, you, some, the one I'm doing is not consecutive. Uh, you can find them from Genesis to Revelation. I'm doing one that's, that's kind of all over the place, a little bit here and, and there, but through the end of the year, we'll finish the whole Bible. You can find tons of reading plans that are three days and six days and 10 days and 20 days and 30 days and 40 days long on, on literally any topic you can think of. On any subject any, in your Christian life you can think of, there will, be a, there will be devotions you can read and there will be scripture passages you will read uh, in connection with that devotion. And so you read God's word and you spend time there. You can just pick up, in, you know, if, the old-fashioned way, just take your Bible and turn to the, to the beginning where it says Holy Bible and then genuine leather and then just start at that point and read everything in between. That works too, all right? So you just say, okay, God, I'm going to listen to your word, and I want to do what your word's telling me. And so you just begin to read God's word, and you say, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to be in church. I'm going to listen to God's word as someone's preaching it and teaching, and I'm going to read God's word, and I'm going to pray. And so you pray. And remember last week we talked about what prayer is. Prayer is having a conversation with my Heavenly Father. I did ask Courtney. She said she got an A+. Plus in her homework assignment, my daughter asked me two weeks ago, what's the definition of prayer? I have a homework assignment to ask a lot of people about that. I think she asked one, me. And she said nobody else did the homework assignment, so she got the A+. Plus <laughs> in her class. So you just pray. You talk to your Heavenly Father. Listen to worship music. Listen to worship music. I don't care what style it is. If it's worship music, just listen to it. Listen to God's word being sung. Just like we did this morning. Not sure where to go. I Go to K-Love on your radio station. Or go, to, or go to Arizona Shine. Very similar types of music being on both of those. But you get a whole variety of music that way. But whatever floats your boat when it comes to worship, whether it's old hymns or gospel music, whatever it may be, just go to those. Making sure you're listening when you're driving down the road or something. And then fellowship with other Christians. You fellowship with one another. You get to know one another. Get into a Sunday school class. You're hearing God's word, but you also get to talk to other Christians. You find out about their lives, and then you get together for, for a dinner once in a while in a small group, or you, or, you, or you go out for coffee or whatever it may be, and you just get to know one another, and you fellowship with each other. And you find that connection with other people. In verse 5 here in Romans uh, chapter 8, Paul says, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on the desires or what the Spirit rather desires. And so when you say, I'm going to feed my spiritual nature, those are the ways that you feed your spiritual nature. You set your heart on those things that the Spirit desires when you spend time in God's Word with God's people. But 
While you're doing that, let me tell you, it might be helpful to help starve the old nature at the same time. Feed the good wolf, starve the mean wolf. Starve the bad one, starve your old nature. Now, how are you going to do that? I, I didn't have room to put that in there, so you can write it on the side of the page or something if you can't figure these out. I bet you can figure out. I'm just going to give you four, and you'll get the idea. And then trust me, if you do these four, you'll be well down the road to starving your old nature. How are you going to starve your old nature? Well, in our society today, I would say avoid TV shows that the old nature likes. Do I have to tell you which ones those are? There's some really good TV, and there's some really, really, really lousy, raunchy TV. So just say no to the bad, raunchy stuff. You say, well, I'm a grown-up, and I can take it. No, you can't. That's the whole point. You pour that stuff into your life, you're feeding your old nature, and now you're stuck in Saturday again, aren't you? That's what got you there, and that's what keeps you there. So you have to make some choices. And if you're going to starve the old nature and feed the new one, you're going to have to decide what you let in. And so you avoid that stuff that the old nature likes. Avoid websites that the old nature likes. And surely I don't have to get real specific on that, do I? And that may mean you have to say, I don't have any control, I, just, I can't control my old nature right now while it's still pretty strong, I've got to keep starving. That may mean, you know, sometimes it, you may have to let go of your internet, or you may have to let go of your cable TV, and just say, I can't, I can't control this right now. The only way to starve it in my old nature is to get rid of it for a while. Guys, maybe you need to move your, tele your computer into the family room where all the kids are at and your wife's at so that everybody's watching what you're, what, what you're doing on the computer. So well, I don't want to do that. Well, yeah, then you really need to. Avoid people who tend to feed the old nature. There's, all, there's people around us who, even though they're Christians, might help you feed your old nature. And you don't need that. And then, I would say avoid situations that tend to feed the old nature. There's always going to be situations that come up and you say, you know what, I know I have this opportunity to go do this or to be in that situation, but I don't need it not going to help me right now and so you say no so how do you avoid them well you do whatever you have to do to avoid them it's going to be different in every time every time it comes up in every situation but you just say okay i have to just not do that and so i'm not so so you do whatever you have to do to starve your old nature you feed the part that you want to win the battle in your life and if you've been stuck in Saturday, you've been feeding the wrong nature. You don't get out of there until you feed the right nature, until you feed the new nature, and you starve the old nature. It's as simple as that. And, and so you do whatever you have to. You feed the part that you want to win the battle in your life. But there's a third thing that Paul tells us here before we close. And the third thing that Paul tells us is that thirdly, you need to take advantage of your clean slate. You choose to believe it's possible. You say, okay, I am going to feed my new nature and then I'm going to take advantage of the clean slate that I've been given. Because when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid the price for your sins, you were forgiven once and for all, and you were given a clean slate. So the question is, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with this clean slate of your life that God has given to you? How are you going to use it? Now, let me move to another movie here just for a moment. And, um, and this is a movie that's not one of my favorite movies of the whole world. Um, but there's, there's a scene in the movie Bonnie and Clyde. 
And, you know, maybe you've seen that movie, um, and um, or maybe you haven't, but you know the story of Bonnie and Clyde, most of us do anyway. Uh, where, and there's this, but there's a scene in this movie where Bonnie and Clyde are, Clyde are, are held, or they're holding up uh, in, a, in, a, in a hideout somewhere because they're unable to move around because the police are on their trail, and they're, they're kind of sensing that things are, aren't going so well for them. Um, they're... At that point where it's become obvious to them that a life of crime isn't as glamorous as they once imagined it would be. And, uh, and Bonnie Parker, the lady, is dreaming of a new life somewhere. Um, a clean life. A, a where they could start over and live like other people do. And so there's this conversation that takes place in this scene. And, and she asks Clyde, she says, Clyde, she says, what would you do if by some miracle... Um, uh, we were able to walk out of here clean with no record and nobody after us. What do you think you'd do, Clyde? He thought about it for a moment, and this is what he answered. He said to Bonnie, well, I guess I'd do things different. He said, first of all, I wouldn't live in the same state where I pull my bank jobs. And when I wanted to rob a bank, I'd go to another state. Well, Bonnie turns away in disappointment because that isn't what she had in mind. But that's what Clyde Barrow had in mind. That's Clyde for you. That's the kind of thinking that keeps us stuck in Saturday. The Bible tells us in Romans 8.1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for us. That means that our slate is clean and we're free to walk out the door and live a brand new life. But some, there's something about that old man, that old nature that lives within us still, even though we know Jesus is our Savior, that, that prefers life on the run it prefers and we sometimes find ourselves going back to that dreadful painful unglamorous existence that we wish we could get away from and we know how to get out of it but we just don't we're just stuck there we were safe from the muck and yet sometimes we just can't wait to jump back into it and get stuck there again that's the Clyde Barrow in each one of us. That, that sinful creature who is always longing to return to the old way of life. But I got to tell you, Christian, God sets you free. He gives you this fresh start and so that you will never have to go back to that again. You don't have to live life on the lamb like Bonnie and Clyde. God pours out his grace not so you can be a better Clyde Barrow but so that you can experience the dreams of the Bonnie Parker who wants a life that's different but doesn't know what to do about it. The dreams of a new life free from the chains of the past, free from guilt, free to start again. That's what God gives to us. Bonnie and Clyde were obviously both criminals. And they were sinners and they were both condemned. But in this probably a fictional vignette, from their lives it gives us insight into who we are it gives us light into our lives because your inner Clyde Barrow may want to use the freedom as an excuse to sin more but God has given you grace and that grace is that your so that your other self inside of you the one with those Bonnie Parker dreams can experience the full freedom of life in Christ. You've been given this clean slate as a Christian, a slate that's wiped clean again every day of your life. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You've been given this clean slate through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Now, the question is, whose dreams you will choose to follow today? You've been set free, pardoned and released. 
you can walk out the door in victory. Let's pray together. Thank you for joining us today for Faith Point. Reach us online at firstsouthernpv.org or stop by to worship with us if you are in the Prescott Valley area. May God richly bless you today as you allow your faith to intersect with your life.